I'm Ziming Liu. I'm from MIT and iFi. I'm advised by Professor Max Tagmark, uh, working in the intersection of AI and physics. Uh, previously, although uh, recently Max switched his uh, research focus to uh, safety, mechanistic interpretability, but there's still a lot of uh, overlap, right? We care in general science, like uh, interpretability for science, um, but but maybe not only science, but but recently uh, also about large language models. Uh, anyway, so today I'm going to talk about uh, growing brains in artificial neural networks, uh, which uh, covers two of our recent work. One work is Brain for AI, where we take brains, we develop a brain-inspired method to uh, for AI interpretability. And uh, the, the second work, basically using the tool we built in the first paper to encourage modularity, encourage in uh, like AI for brain. So yeah, without further ado, let's jump right in. So uh, our, our first motivation for this line of work is uh, interpretability. We know that neural networks are extremely powerful machines, but they are notoriously uh, difficult to be interpreted. So uh, we want to, in order to keep them safe and um, we we want to gain some interpretation of them, but there are many levels of interpretation. You can uh, there are neuron level interpretation where we want to understand what each neuron is doing, and the other extreme is this model level interpretation where we just uh, think of neural network as as a oracle uh, with this input output pair. There's this intermediate level, which we call the module level interpretability, we think is the most promising level. And uh, the reason why is that if you think of the trade-off between the complexity of some of the interpretation, the inaccuracy of the interpretation, the model level interpretation is too inaccurate or informative, not informative because it's not telling you what's going on inside uh, the black box. On, on the other hand, the neural level is maybe too too subtle, too complicated, because we need to explain what each neuron is doing. So the module level hopes that you can disentangle a network into different parts, and different parts responsible for some certain human interpretable function. And this uh, modules they are uh, sparsely connected in a again in an interpretable way. Uh, uh, that's the hope. Uh, that's the plan. Uh, that's the hope with the this module level interpretability. So uh, it's not totally uh, well wild dreams because uh, in vision systems and language systems, at least for some particular simple toy tasks, people have discovered such modularity can emerge or networks. Like uh, for computer vision tasks, people discovered that there are these uh, curve detectors, and for language tasks, um, for this what they call in that indirect object identification task, they find that in GPT-2 they can identify this nice circuit, um, which quite aligned with you know our concept how humans would uh, do such tasks. So if we believe in this module level interpretation, how do we go about to make this uh, you know interpretation e even easier? And I would argue that locality can make things much easier in the sense that if you have a neural network with no locality, well, actually for common neural networks, there's no sense of locality. Like if you take a fully connected neural networks, the neurons, they are all permutable. They have this permutation symmetry and there's no uh, sense of you know spatial coordinates in it. So um, for a neural network with no locality, then to describe a network, to describe um, um, the network in terms of module, in the language of module, you need to describe, you need to tell which each neuron is belonging to which module. Like the first neuron belongs to the red module, the second neuron belongs to the blue module. So the description length, so to speak, of the description uh, is proportional to the number of neurons because you need to assign a module label to each neuron. Uh, and it's also not clear how to do that. Um, but on the other hand, if you have locality in your model, basically, if one neuron is a red neuron, then very likely its neighbor will also be a red neuron. Uh, it, it's it's very much like in our human body or the uh, 
cerebral cortex where uh well each local like the localized regions responsible for uh, certain functions so it, if we have locality uh in your network then we only need to, to to the only thing we need to do is to draw boundaries between these modules like in this case if the red and blue modules they are nicely separated then all you need to do is to um have a knife cut through this two and realize that the left part is red and the right part is blue and then the description length is basically just on the order of depth because you need only to indicate where you want to cut through these two modules so can i ask a quick question yeah sure yeah hi uh so uh when you when you say locality you just, you talk about it in terms of function right like in your example, uh, if one neuron is performing, uh, contributing a certain function, its neighboring neuron is also likely contributing to the same function. Does that right. also imply locality in terms of structure, meaning that in these neural networks, uh, does it also require sort of local connections, like topographic connections, or even with all-to-all -all connections, could you expect uh, yeah, uh, locality? Yeah. That's a yeah, that's a good question. So, so um, may maybe I need to make explicit distinction between functional modularity and uh, anatomical modularity. So functional modularity means that two neurons perform similar, uh, like both responsible for some certain function, that's functional modularity. And anatomical modularity meaning that um, the, like the neuronal connections are local. Um, so, so by here, I, I haven't gotten into the details. Uh, so here, here, maybe I'm, I, I meant both. Uh, you can think of it as both, or some uh, even abstract sense of modularity. But I will get into uh, some detail uh, after this. Uh, yeah. Okay. Sure. So, uh, so, so in this slide, I argue that locality is is a very is is a simplifying property uh, to achieve mo module level interpretation. So we we already know that. Our brains, at least in the cerebral cortex, um, localized regions like functional modular regions are localized in space. But is do our uh, are are the artificial neural networks having the same uh, property? And I argue that no, because there's a key difference between brains and artificial neural networks, in that uh, for our brains there's a selective advantage for modular brains. So for, for modular brains, I mean that uh, relevant neurons, right? So, so functional modular uh, neurons, they're also anatomically modular in space. They're, they're put close to space. So the connection, the, the, so, so the communication between, uh, so the average, uh, so the connections between these uh, neurons are relatively uh, shorter. And so, hence the connection, the communication speed, the, the, the time, the, the time delay also shorter if you have a modular brain. Uh, as a result, human beings with uh, modular brains tend to react faster than uh, people who don't have modular brains. Hence, uh, modular brains are more uh, likely to survive, are more likely to survive, uh, hence have a selective or evolutionary advantage uh over uh non-modular brains however artificial neural networks do not have such survival advantages because uh if you think about it the, tr the training objective is just to make prediction uh as correct as 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 uh, accurately as possible well you 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 may think you may argue one may argue that they are there may, might be implicit regularizations that may encourage modularity, like drop out, like all kinds of regularization, but they're just encourage modularity in an implicit, unclear way. So in general, we do not expect artificial neural networks to have uh, survival, uh, sorry, to, to, to have modularity because there's no uh, survival advantage for artificial neural networks to become modular. Um, so, so inspired by this, um, uh, I argue that we need to explicitly introduce uh, 
introduce some uh, training techniques to explicitly induce modularity in otherwise non-modular networks. Say you take a fully connected neural network, which by default are not uh, modular. Uh, all the neurons in, in, in some consecutive layers, they're, they're densely connected. But we, we want to you know, train the network in some uh, strange or, or, or smart ways so, that's, so that the modularity can emerge uh, after training. So um, the key here is, it, it is actually quite simple. It's, it's just, I, I, will, I will spell the word again. It's just the, uh, the locality. Um, so, so in this paper, uh, we propose the method called brain-inspired modular training. Although it has a fancy word, word called brain-inspired, it's actually just introducing locality, sense of locality into neural networks. Uh, so by that, I mean, so previously, um, neurons in artificial neural networks do not have spatial coordinates associated to each neuron. But here we assign a 2D, a two-dimensional coordinate X and Y to each neuron and embed the whole neural network into a two-dimensional Euclidean space. Um, in general, it, can, it, it, it cannot only be 2D Euclidean space, it can be any arbitrary geometric space where you can define uh, uh, coordinates and distances. But, but for simplicity, we can embed them into this 2D Euclidean space. And embed with this uh, metric, we can, we can compute distances between uh, neurons. And, mm -hmm. and in this sense, we can define the length of the weight connection, not only the magnitude of the connection uh, of the weight, but also the length of the connection. So uh, with this picture in mind, uh, we penalize, so, so previously, to encourage a network to be sparse, people usually use the L1 regularization, which is basically lambda is the a penalizing strength times the magnitude of the weight. But here we, we basically take the L1 regularization, but it also be multiplied by the length of the connection. Meaning that if the uh, connection is longer then it's penalized more strongly than a connection that is shorter. So uh, this objective, um, bias towards a solution that is uh, 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 a solution that has shorter uh, connections. Well, but but you but actually this doesn't work uh, if you just penalize uh, if you just naively add this connection cost term into your training because your network can still very easily get stuck at some uh, long connection you know configuration. Um, a fourth experiment, is that if you start off from a, a densely connected network, which have many long range connections, but it already achieved the task perfectly well, then there is no you know, incentive for it to simplify. So to avoid that, we also do this kind of discrete optimization we call the neuron swapping. Um, so suppose, we have a neural network like this. Um, the red neurons are, they come from a module, they're strongly connected and the blue neurons, uh, they're another module and they're uh, strongly connected. If we find that swapping uh, the two neurons, the, the blue neuron and the red neuron in the middle layer can reduce the connection cost, then we do the swapping. So basically uh, our method consists of two has two gradients. Uh, one ingredient is uh, we have this differentiable penalizing term, which encourage uh, local connection. Uh, another uh, ingredient, and another ingredient is we allow neurons to swap. If swapping the two, if swapping the two neurons can reduce uh, can reduce the connection cost. So we do these two steps. Uh, iteratively, like we we train for a while, we do swapping, and we then train for a while, and then swapping, and, and until it converges to something, or like um, we meet the compute budget. So um, an example of this. Uh, so let's consider a very simple example, which is basically uh, regress a polynomial function with a neural network. Okay, so. The input here is has four variables x1 to x4, 
And there are two output variables, which basically just the second order polynomials of these four variables. But it has some interesting structure. Like the first variable, the first output is x4, x, x1, x4 plus x2, x3. And the second output is x1, x4 minus x2, x3. So uh, we would we might imagine that the way we compute this is basically compute x1, x4 first, compute x2, x3 first, and then linearly combine these two things to obtain the final output. Um, and so it's, it's not surprising to find that with a densely connected network, although your performance is quite good, uh, it's still densely connected, re revealing no obvious structure uh, from this data set. If you use um, the Lina L1 regularization, um, you'll get a sparse network, but it's still not clear what the structure is. Um, but if we jump right to the rightmost uh, figure with our BIMT method, which involves both L1 and local, it's a local L1 and involves swapping, then you see that some something remarkably sparse and modular emerge out of it. And um, although, I, I, although I don't have a plot here, uh, we can check that uh, the two neurons in the second to last layer are exactly x1, x4, uh, and x2, x3, up to some rescaling and uh, translation. So uh, by just looking at the plot, you can immediately see some nice structure uh, out of it. Uh, and without too much sacrifice in uh, loss, although they're like, uh, 10 times, around 10 times, or even 30 times, of, uh, uh, becomes worse in terms of MSE, but that's acceptable. Uh, the point is, here we obtain something uh, interpretable with our method. You can uh, directly see the modules. Uh, these two modules in the first two layers, they don't, they don't talk to each other. Uh, and it, it's, cl it's clearly like, like the, the depend, at least the dependence, how, uh, these variables are dependent on each other and how the variables are combined uh, to, find, to, to, to get the final output, uh, the computational graph is clear uh, with our method. Uh, otherwise, you, you cannot get with um, other methods. Can I ask a question? Yeah, sure. The, um, like uh, in, the, in the fourth figure, which is just L1 plus uh, swap, um, like uh, in theory, the swap operation shouldn't uh, really do anything in this case for the actual training procedure. Am I right? Uh, you mean you mean the subfigure yeah. D? Yeah. So so here it looks like the local part does not help that much, but uh, it still refines a little bit. Yeah. Like they are uh, very similar in this example. Right, right, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but if you look closely, maybe there's some <laughs> long range connections here. Uh, yeah, I won't argue I that know. the local part is 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 necessary. It's I would say it's uh, it's a bit example dependent. Okay. Um, Maybe yeah. like in this uh, in this image, I don't know if there are very faint lines in between. Uh, you mentioned back from the stream, I can't see the, those lines. So yeah, it's it's also mentioned like for subfigure D. It's also like no one has proposed it before. It's a, it's a just a special case of our. Hmm. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thanks. I guess the the local part and swap part is uh, for the same objective, but. Uh... Maybe the local part uh, sometimes it's non differentiable, so you need to swap, and swap is not very accurate, so it's a kind of balance. Right, it's 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 a kind of trade off. Like uh, the thin lines. Well, yeah, yeah, it's a bit hard to analyze, but I I get I yeah I agree with the picture, yeah. Can I can I ask another question in the previous figure? Yeah, sure. Uh, in the subfigure E, um, um, there are just two neurons in the second layer, right? right. Um, yeah. Are there or do they by any chance represent x one, x four, and x two, x three? Did you check that by any chance? Yeah, check that. It 
they're exactly um, x1, x4, x2, x3, uh, up to some uh, constant scaling. That's like good. Yeah. And I was asking a question, um, how reliable is the training procedure there? So how often do you get exactly these results or how often do you get suboptimal in terms of number of connections, for instance? Mm, that's a good question. Um, so the structure are basically similar, but if in terms of detail, like, um, well, it's it's again it it's again depends on um uh, how difficult the example is. Like for this example, it's quite robust even in the slightest details. But for more complicated examples, uh, the details of the connection can be uh, different. And um, yeah, to think of it here, you are multiplying like x one x four is multiplying two numbers, right? But if you do some construction, uh, actually you only need two neurons to do the task. Uh, if you are doing, the, if you're using this ReLU, uh, I'm using this, uh, sorry, SILU, I'm using the SILU activation. So you only need two neurons to do the task, but I ended up, but the method finds three neurons. So in some sense, it's still not the most efficient uh, solution pos that's uh, possible, but um, it's something uh, like, easier to be found for 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 networks so uh the robustness yeah again in, in general I, I i i didn't test really hard about it but like uh the short answer is those the structures are similar but the the slightest details can be different uh depending on random seed oh thanks I'll, I'll, also so, um you go ahead all right. Oh. Yeah. Uh, the, uh, the the network in uh, Figure E is uh, like almost by exactly bilaterally symmetrical. Is that by design or is that like a byproduct of some aspect of? Uh, I, I, it's it's discovered by itself. It's 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 something, um, I, I personally found amazing. Uh, it's 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 just that, uh, this is the simplest possible thing, and he just find and 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 he just finds it. Yeah. Very cool. Yeah. Um, another question. Did you benchmark this, for instance, with similar methods or not similar methods, but other um, topology searching methods like NEAT? Because these are this method also allows to find very, very um, small networks which achieve the task perfectly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a good question. So um, after we finished this project, we were thinking, um, maybe combining NEAT with this can be a nice choice because uh, NEAT is good at producing regular patterns. Um, and yeah, maybe combining the best of both models would be nice. But then I tried, not exactly NEAT, but just I, I have a hyper network producing the weights. And then it, it doesn't work very well uh, because well, in 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 the network uh, I I show here, you can see that the weights actually well have high variations. Like uh, like red 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 line means it's a positive weight, and blue lines means it's a negative weight. So it's oscillating too fast, and I'm not sure if NEAT can capture this. But yeah. but but maybe adding some positional encoding, adding some high high dimensional, uh, uh, sorry, high frequency um, biases can help need to learn it, but I still didn't get around that technical issue. So it, it, yeah, if you guys have any idea how to combine these two in a more you know consistent way, I'm, I'm more than happy to chat, yeah. Thank you. I can think about it. It's, it's really interesting. Yeah, wonderful. Yeah. Yeah. So 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 here are just some more examples. Um, the first example is that the first output variable only depend on x two and x four, 
and the second variable only depends on x1 and x3. So the network learns to automatically split the network into two parts uh, which don't talk to each other. So by looking at the graph, you know, uh, you can immediately tell the independent structure. And the second example, again, it's, 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 it's very interesting. It's similar to the example I showed in the last slide. Uh, there are three, you need to do the function, you need to do the squared function three times. And for, and, and these three motifs here, they look extremely similar. It's like, I did not impose anything to say that I encourage, you know, repetitive patterns, but it's just something that it rediscovered. It, it's just, uh, the squared function is just rediscovered uh, for three times. Um, and the last example uh, highlights the highlights it can discover uh, Excuse me. A highlight is can discover the compositionality of a formula. So if you compute this, you would first imagine you would compute the squares, sum of squares, and then take the square root. And uh, this is this is this is exactly what uh, the network finds. So you see that in the second to last, um, in the yeah, in this layer, there's only one active hidden neuron. And if, if we plot it. Um, and plot it against the output, then you see you nicely got a square root function. So basically, the network learns to compute squares of uh, sum of squares first, and then take two layers to to compute the square root. So this is again aligned with our uh, human intuition. Like if we don't know the formula a priori by looking at the graph we can know that there is this uh, compositionality uh, property. And uh, we, we can also do this for module addition. Um, the, the setup is that, well, three plus five is eight, um, module 11, like for each, that sounds an extremely simple task, but our setup is more like in the large language model setup it, where uh, each, which number is recognized as a token, which has a token embedding it's embedded in like 32 dimensions, which are trainable and random and are randomly initialized uh, at first. So the networks are tasked to learn both the weights of the model, but also the embeddings of the tokens. So that task is actually is not that trivial. You need to learn uh, the representation of the, of the numbers. And usually we find that uh, the, your neural net, the neural net would put the numbers around the circle, uh, just like on a clock, like like when you read a clock, three plus five is eight because uh, the addition of the angle of three plus the addition of the angle five uh, gives you the angle of eight. So uh, yeah, so so th so that's a so this algorithmic data sets are uh, used a lot. Uh, in the machine learning community to 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 study the you know mechanistic interpretability of neural networks. Here, I just take it as an example to show that um, by applying BIMT to this uh, data set, we can have you know uh, sparse and modular structures to emerge that are much more interpretable if you don't use BIMT. Uh, Well, what's interesting here is that you see that there are three independent uh, trunks uh, emergent. And for each, uh, uh, there are three heads. And for, for each head, if you look at the representation of the numbers, they are put on different circles. And the last one is even a 3D object. It, it looks like a bow tie. But if you, pro if you project it onto uh, 2D properly, it's, a, it's again a circle. Um, and What's nice about this is that there's no need to search for directions because if you think about uh, it, it, like uh, commonly word embeddings have this rotational symmetry, uh, but if you add sparsity and add this kind of to 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 uh, minimize this connection cost, then um, there's symmetry breaking. There's no longer this uh, rotational symmetry and um, each component, each dimension will be will itself be meaningful 
you don't need to you know explicitly search for a direction that is meaningful and uh we did some ablation studies and find that if we knock out any one of the head the performance severely degrades uh meaning that it's basically uh like a like a majority voting maybe not majority voting because the uh, lodges are additively contributed uh, are additively aggregated uh in the in, in in the last layer but there's some kind of voting mechanism going on which is also quite cute because we didn't impose this such mechanism but neural networks just discovers it uh, by itself. Um, well, here are just some more uh, algorithmic data set. Here we do, we compute the permutation group. Uh, it's it's just show, um, show the structure uh, of the network uh, trained with BIMT. Uh, what's surprising here is that we find there's a separate input neuron here and we plot it, we find that it corresponds we find that it corresponds to uh, the parity of the group element, whether it's an even permutation or it's an odd permutation. Uh, so it's it's precisely the parity uh, of the group element, which is a which is also quite cute because uh, it's it's aligned with uh, human intuition and the, and the mathematical concepts. Well, so, so, so before, um, I only embed a network in a two, in two D Euclidean space, but we can go beyond that. Like, if we are dealing with image data, the image itself is two D, and we have an extra dimension, a depth data, a depth dimension. Then it's better to, it's more natural to embed it, to embed a network into three D Euclidean space. So here's what we do with the MNIST data. So uh, the neurons, both the input neurons and the hidden neurons, they are uh, arranged on a two-dimensional grid and their distances are computed in 3D Euclidean space. So we do similar thing, train, uh, apply BIM to like amnist classification and we end up with this uh, well, beautifully looking um, image, although I have to confess that it's not that interpretable. Maybe that's because uh, it's it's difficult to explain with words, with language, how we do like visual processing. But the point here is that it's not limited uh, to like to the Euclidean space. It can be a very general method. Can I ask you a question? Like uh, most computer vision algorithms uh, use uh, convolutional neural networks. Mm -hmm. So it basically yeah. enforce uh, locality by using a finite dimensional uh, window. Yeah, yeah. Like, do you see this thing uh, emerging from the way you train the model? Like it becomes uh, more similar to a convolutional neural network? Yeah, so we indeed look at the convolutional filters. Um, sorry, I don't have it in the slides here, but it's in the appendix of the paper so so it so the convolution of filters learned in our network is actually have a difference uh than convolution of filters in cnn like like in cnn at first you learn some low level uh low level structures like edge detector and then you um gradually compose this um lo low level features to get high level to get high level uh, features. But in, in our case, the first layer already captures high level uh, features. Uh, well, maybe maybe this is simply because it starts from a densely connected network. It has larger receptive field, but in CNN, the size of a filter is usually quite small. So you only are constrained to look at like local regions. But yeah, uh, like the learned filters in our network is quite different from CNN. And, and another difference is that um, CNN explicitly have this sharing mechanism, uh, but we don't have any sharing mechanism. So I don't know if it's a feature or a bug of our method, but I, I would say maybe it's a feature, <laughs> but I, I'm also thinking about, uh, is it possible to marry 
uh, CNN to our method to both enjoy the like um, more flexibility as in our method because it not necessarily look at local features, but also utilizing the sharing mechanism so that you can compress a network more or more like you know uh, or more like human visual system. Yeah, that, that makes uh, sense. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, maybe a follow-up question on that. How robust are your networks in this 2D examples with respect to spatial transformations, like um, moving the image or scaling the, the digits? Uh, oh, I didn't do that. I, I, I just take the original MNIST uh, data set. Sorry. Yeah. yeah, sure, because that's more or less the power behind CNN, uh, CNNs, right? So so that would oh, be interesting for this case, how important oh, your inter single neurons are or how robust they are with respect to fluctuations in the input. I mean, you have a lot of different examples in the data set, of course. Oh, I see. I see. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah right. to, to continue this yeah. to continue this question, according to this, the, the, this image that you show, the, the network reduce a lot of robustness, meaning that every decision is based on fewer and fewer neuron, which is less less what you will come up with with the biology, which has much more robustness. So I would think that the network is also um, sensitive to hijack. You know the time that you can modify the image a little bit and then you decide if that image is more like one and not zero only because you add a sticker on somewhere. Yeah, I totally agree. I totally agree. So robustness. So I would say that robustness and uh, there's a trade-off between robustness and sparsity at least. If it's too sparse, then you, 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 can, you, can, you can just uh, add noise to the sparse parts and, and and screw the whole thing. But if it's not sparse, then it's much more robust. Um, so 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 like our goal is to interpret something. So uh, our strategy our strategy is that well we don't think about robustness for a while. We just get the smallest network that can do the task in a non-robust way, but still interpretable. And maybe then we, if we want want the algorithm to be robust, and then we uh, ensemble them in a clever way. But like each part of them, we can have some understanding of, and yeah. Yeah, sure. So, so above, I, I basically talked about the brain for AI, uh, and. And 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 next, I'm going to talk a bit about AI for brain. But probably more, more like brain inspired AI for brain. It's a it's a little bit mouthful. Uh, by brain inspired AI, I simply mean uh, the the BIMP method that we proposed. Um, but before diving right into neuroscience or brain, I think. The method we proposed, BIMT, is can be a quite general tool uh, for science in general. Like many many scientific problems can be formulated as a regression, just given uh, independent variables x1, x2, to xd, and independent variable y. We want to find a function. We want to find a relation, right? Basically, write y as a function of x1, x2, to xd. So uh, previously. What how scientists did it is maybe come up with a symbolic form for it and have some you know feasible uh, trainable coefficients and fit that you have some measurements in experiments and you have uh, you have a conjectured symbolic form for that and then you fit your theory you fit your theoretical model uh, to your uh, experimental data by adjust that coefficients but it's quite um, not flexible, right? Because you you need to come up with those symbolic, um, those symbolic formulas with educated guesses, and sometimes you can miss something. But I argue that I I, I haven't had many examples, but I argue that such um, like our like our BIMP method 
can help you gain some in at least gain some insight on how to formulate this uh, symbolic terms. Or I actually, I, I actually a less a, a even a even more humble goal is is not to come up with a symbolic formula, but uh, just tell you what's the structure uh, behind the data set. So, uh, yeah, and and uh, recently we are basically we, we are eager to have uh, we are like actively collecting uh, data sets from all kinds of fields, including uh, fluid mechanics, biophysics, uh, quantum uh, materials, etc., and applying BIMT um, to all kinds of data sets. Basically, as long as your as long as your problem can be formulated as a regression problem. BIMT can give it a try uh, and may or may not, it can discover something, but uh, there's no loss in trying it. So again, here's an advertisement. If you guys have any uh, data set that you figure that maybe there's some interesting structures, interesting modularity, module structures hidden uh, in the data set, then I'm more than happy to collaborate. You can just send me the data set and I can run the code and uh, return back to you and because you are the domain experts you can tell me whether there's something interesting or it's a total mess but anyway uh so i see a lot of potential in applying bim uh to scientific problems in general uh, but recently we have tried one thing which is applying bim to like uh to to neuroscience uh specifically we um we like traditionally we have a recurrent neural network to do cognitive tasks. So the setup is that um, your input, uh, you have one dimension telling you that it's fixation or not, and you also receive stimulus. Uh, you have two. You, you received a stimulus of two different modalities, and each stimulus is just a ring. Uh, tell, telling you which angle it is. Uh, and you also have this so-called rule input, which tells you which task you are performing. Like there are 20 tasks or 84 tasks. Uh, basically the rule input is a one hot vector. Um, if you are performing the first task, then the first component is activated. If you're performing the second task, the second component is activated. Okay, and uh, in the hidden, in the hidden layer, it's a recurrent structure. It's connecting, like they're just hidden to hidden connections, just recursively uh, going around uh, in the in the hidden layer. And until uh, you read out uh, to get uh, to produce some output. So, so this is like a standard uh, recurrent neural network uh, for the cognitive tasks. And what's interesting is that after you train and RN to do this ta cognitive task, is there any structure coming out of, like, is there any structure hidden in this uh, hidden neurons, in this hidden to hidden connections? So, so this is uh, already known like four years ago, uh, robot Guan Yu Yang uh, here at MIT. Um, he wrote this, uh, paper saying that uh, finding that there are functional modularity in uh, this trained recurrent neural networks. By functional neural modularity means that there are neurons which have similar functions, uh, and they form and they form clusters in function space. So to make it more concrete, uh, if a neuron or uh, equivalently if a unit is a constant function for a task, then it has no importance over the task because it's just a con constant function, it's very boring. But if that unit has high variance for a task, uh, by that I mean, so a task contains many samples, contains many time series, many examples. So the va variance is measured on those um, samples belonging to the same task. So if a unit has high variance for a task, then it's important for the task. So for each neuron, you can measure is task variances for all the tasks to get a task variance vector. And then if two neurons have the same task variance vector 
we have a sense that they perform uh, functionally similar. So basically this boils down to a clustering problem in this task variant space. Each neuron is basically a point in the task variant space, and we want to run clustering algorithm for other neurons to see if there are any cluster structures. And indeed, you can see there are some uh, cluster structures. Some clusters responsible for the, for the goal task, some uh, for the uh, decision-making, uh, uh, et cetera. Right, but but here is the question. So, so uh, this results imply that there is this functional modularity, but what about anatomical modularity? That is, if two functions, uh, if two neurons perform similar functions, are they necessarily close in space? Uh, actually, for standard neural networks, as I said, there is no notion of locality. There is no notion of spatial coordinates. So it's impossible to talk about, even talk about anatomical modularity in standard neural networks. But it's but but it's possible with BIMT, where each neuron is assigned a spatial coordinate. So uh, we ask this question, is it possible with BIMT to create co-emergence of functional and anatomical modularity, just like in our cerebral cortex? Um, so, so again, the key is to introduce locality into the whole thing. Uh, what we did is we place hidden neurons on a 2D grid. So each neuron, so each hidden neuron has two coordinates x and y. Uh, and in training, we regularize hidden to hidden connections in the BIMT style. Uh, and, and also we allow hidden neurons to swap if uh, this can bring down like the connection costs. And now in the hidden connect in the hidden layer, you see that uh, the peripheral neurons, they don't have any connection to other neurons, which meaning that they are not important. They are pruned away or they're dead. So we can basically focus on uh, the neurons, the active neurons in the center. So um, we already have the method to classify uh, what each neuron belongs to like functionally. So now for each neuron, we can compute which function modules it belongs to and colored with different colors. Say, uh, so you, yeah, you can see that the the red neurons, they basically cluster in space, although not, although not that perfectly, like they're still scattered around uh, in the, in a plot, but you can still see some giant clusters of uh, blue, red, and green. And by contrast, if you just, if you don't, if you use the regular L1 regularization, well, it's, well, there's no notion of space in it, right? So it's not surprising to see that uh, the, the, the um, neurons with similar functions, they're scattered around uh, in the plot. So I have a question. Yep. So since you have the have the space notion, uh, then then some operation of space like a shrink or resize can be applied. So I, I'm wondering, is it possible to change the resolution of the two D panel when you're training or after training? Would it affect the performance? Um, by resolution, you mean maybe increase the speed from 10 by 10 to 20 to 20 by doing some interpolation in the... Yeah, like... or de decrease it. So oh, it, you, you reduce its performance or make better. Oh, oh yeah, that's very interesting. Because uh, yeah, also in physics, there's a concept called renormalization group where you coarse grain to... Yeah, yeah. Uh, units which are close in space. Yeah, that's a very interesting point. Uh, we haven't tried it, but it's worth trying. Yeah. I'd also say I used the same idea, but instead of renormalization when they're close in space, I renormalized when they are close um, by correlation or by like dynamic, and it made some interesting course grading as well. So it might be worth looking at here as well. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's a good su suggestion. Are you saying that uh, you did that, or there are people already done that uh, before? Somebody has done it. They did it really simply in a in a data set from mice, 
And then I mm -hmm. used the method uh, when the, when a ma like a live real mouse was doing a task and was able to do some really interesting analysis using the resulting coarse grain signals. Oh, interesting. Um, yeah. Is there any reference you can point me to? Because that sounds extremely relevant. Yeah, let me pull it up. Um, and then if you if if you're interested, we can talk about it in a different. I'll I'll post a, a link in the chat, and then yeah, if sure, it's sure. something you're interested in, we can meet in a different space, and I can show you what I what I did with it. Um, because yeah, I, sure. I, I I changed some of what they did. Yeah, cool. Yeah, definitely. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. I I also have uh, one question. Like, uh, have you tried this uh, this experiment, but we just L one regular. A regularization and the swap mechanism. Oh, you mean L1 regularization? I see, I see. Um, so that's basically setting that's a special case of BIMP. Uh so here BIMP, right. But because um, in BIMP you uh, you also like if it you enforce the locality. Right, right. Penalizing uh, weights that are far away. But if you don't penalize this, but you make the swap mechanism? If I recall correctly, the results are similar. So so actually the the brain plot I show here, the, the local parameter is actually very small, meaning that it's close, it's close to no penalty at all. Mm. Uh, and the ablation study we didn't do that too rigorously, but the impression is that swapping is much more important than locality, oh, okay. uh, differentiable locality. Yeah. Mm, okay, interesting. Yeah, sure. So, um, how do we measure quantitatively the progress here? Like how modular this brain is. So uh, we propose two quantitative measures. The first measure is um, the fraction of isolated neurons. So we define a neuron is isolated if none of its neighbors have the same color. That is, uh, none of its neighbors belongs to the same modules. Um, so to, to get a sense of what the baseline looks like. So we ba we randomly permute these active neurons. Um, we basically permute, randomly permute these active neurons to compute, um, to compute the ratio of uh, isolated neurons for this uh, randomly permutable configurations. And we do this like 10,000 times to get a histogram. And then we indicate where BIMT is, and it's significantly out of distribution, meaning that it's at least not a randomly permuted uh, configuration. It's very different from a, a randomly a random configuration, thus nullifying the null hypothesis. Uh, by contrast, for L1 and fully connected network, uh, you see that the a uh, fraction of isolated neurons, they are uh, still in distribution. This also makes sense because they don't even have the notion of locality. Uh, so uh, they are, they, so in this sense, they are by nature, they're by default randomly permuted. So, uh, but this is just a, a sanity check. And the second quantitative measure is the average cluster size. If something is localized in space, then it must have smaller cluster size than if it's if, if spread over uh, all of the place. So again, we do the blue histogram is the random uh, baseline where we, we, we randomly permute these neurons. Um, and again, we see that BIMP is significantly out of distribution of a, of a, random, of a random brain, meaning that at least they are non-zero anatomical modularity uh, in the brain that, that 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 we obtained here. So yeah, so I think that's that's everything I prepared. I'm yeah, I'm happy to uh, chat more if you guys have questions. Yeah, I have a biological question, which is you uh, started this out. Uh, this is Chris, oh, by the way. Oh, you started this out 
uh, saying something along the lines of brains work better when they have anatomical modularity. Mm. And if you look at humans or, or mammals, then there's a lot of anatomical modularity. And there are also a lot of long distance connections. Mm -hmm. so, uh, in, in particular, three classes of long distance connections are mm -hmm. the thalamocortical connections, the frontal parietal connections, and then the connections across the corpus callosum. Mm -hmm. And uh, that suggests that one could actually test this somewhat philosophical claim that you made by looking at variation in connectivity across the corpus callosum and seeing whether people with less connectivity across the corpus callosum actually work better cognitively. Mm. And we have the extreme case of split brain patients where the corpus has been completely disconnected and they're apparently normal on many tasks and, and severely unusual on, on other tasks. Uh, and, and maybe Wes knows the answer to this question. I don't actually know if connectivity across the corpus callosum has ever been correlated with cognitive performance across some interesting battery of tests. But one would think that would be something that would be possible. Mm. And it might be interesting to try to chase down uh, biological data that would be relevant to uh, when is anatomical modularity actually useful for problem solving as opposed to uh, just being useful for explainability, which which I think your experiments demonstrate utility for explainability very nicely. And the question is, is it really useful for problem solving? Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, thanks for the great comment. I, I, I think one route we can pursue is that, uh, like, is there, so, so BIM produces local connections, but there are still long connections uh, in, in the brain, making it like more more like a critical system, like it, it, maybe it's a parallel uh, correlation or something. So, so an intriguing question for me, for myself, is that how can we modify the method, or do we require a uh, completely different method to reproduce this parallel statistics in brain? Um, not just, yeah, this, uh, yeah. Thanks. Nice talk.